I'm sorry if you heard this one, but uh, I, I feel I need to say it again. Um, it's a story involving my pastor, Monsignor Lucido. Maybe some of you guys know who he is. He was pastor at Holy Rosary there on 2nd and Franklin for over 40 years. Um, he's the only pastor I ever had in my life as a kid. You know, he, uh, you know, he was pastor my whole life. Um, he was the one that always suggested to me about the priesthood and all those sort of things. And uh, he had a painting. And again, I know some of you have heard this before, but, but uh, anyways, he had the painting of today's gospel. Jesus overturning the money changers in the temple area. Big painting covering up his whole back wall behind his office. You know, so he sat at his desk and behind him was that painting. And one day he had two Protestant ministers come in to his office. They were working on a kind of a soup kitchen type of thing for the city of Redden, like an ecumenical kitchen. And he sensed that they were nervous. He suspected that maybe it was the first time they were ever talking to a Catholic priest and in a Catholic rectory. And so to ease the, the tension, he pointed to the painting behind him. And he says, what is that? And the minister said, well, that's Jesus overturning the money changers. And he said, no, it's the first Catholic bingo. There you go. There you go. So... I say that because we're going to have some bingo events happening for our school fundraiser down the road, so it's also relevant for that as well. So stay tuned for that stuff. But, um, but anyways, you know, this passage is a passage I think is often misinterpreted. Um, and before we get into all that, I, I have to do this. I know some of you appreciate this stuff when I go into scripture and history. I won't spend too much time on it, but you really need to know what the temple was all about, okay? So the temple and the idea of having a temple, okay, started with King David in the Old Testament. In fact, in order to establish yourself as a king and have a kingdom, one needed to have a temple for worship, okay? And that, that was the way it was back then in David's time in that Near Eastern culture. You know, if you want to really tell the world that you are a king with a kingdom, you also had a temple, a place of worship in that kingdom. And so that's when David is like, yeah, let's, we need a temple, you know, because he, he did everything else up to that point, you know, unified the, the 12 tribes of Israel, expanded the borders, again, very powerful wealth. But the last thing he needed was a temple. And so that's when he gets the idea, we're going to build a temple, and the prophet Nathan's like, actually, you know, it's not, not really a good idea. God didn't ask for it, but God's going to allow you to do it anyway. So he starts the temple, and then Solomon, the next king, completes it. And there's a very grandiose ceremony, beautiful ceremony, uh, in, in, uh, in First Kings, describing this temple dedication. And then the glory of cloud, which I talked about during Advent and Christmas. The glory cloud of God descends upon the temple. And so now the kingdom of Israel is firmly established. The last piece is there. They have a place, a centrality of worship. Well, the temple lasts for about 400 to 500 years. So again, the Babylonians come to conquer the kingdom and to make the conquest of the kingdom official. They get to Jerusalem, and what do they do? They destroy that one symbol that firmly establishes a kingdom. They destroy the temple, okay? And so the temple is no more. And then about 50 years later, the Persians come in, and they allow the Hebrew people, they allow the, the Jewish people to rebuild the temple. So 50 years later, it's rebuilt, completed, but it's nowhere near the, te the temple that Solomon built. It's a very poor substitute. In fact, we're told in, I believe, the book of Ezra that the people, when they dedicate this new temple, they're crying because those who remember what the old temple used to look like, like it just fails in comparison to that. It's a cheap man's version, okay? 
So fast forward now, we have this second temple, but it's not really an impressive structure, a very simple structure. So now we go now to Jesus's time, to a person named Herod. Yes, the same Herod that instituted the slaughter of the innocents. It's, he's the guy that the wise men go to when they learn about the newborn king of the Jews, the three kings. They go to Herod, and then Herod's like, he, he wants this child to be, to be killed. That same Herod wants to be a king and Messiah-like figure. So what does he do? He starts with this new temple. He starts to renovate it to make it majestic and glorious and impressive. And so as we learn, it takes 46 years. So he starts it, then his son completes it. Up to now today's gospel passage, okay, we have the second temple renovated and it's impressive, okay? So with that in mind, quickly, so what's going on in this gospel passage? The money changers, the oxen, the sheep, are what's in called the outer court of the temple. It's one of the renovations that Herod did. He did this renovation in order to allow Gentiles, those who aren't circumcised, Gentiles who yet believe in the God of Israel, to come in and worship there. We'll hear more about that controversy you know, Gentiles, Jews, circumcision, not circumcision, in the Easter season. Okay, it's like one of the first problems that the Christians are going to tackle. More on that down the road. But this outer court was meant to be a place for the Gentiles to worship. But now they can't worship there. They can't pray there. Why? Because it's filled like a marketplace. It's filled with all these animals, money changers, so what was meant to be sacred space, a space for worship and a space for prayer, is now no more because of the marketplace activity that's happening there. That's why Jesus is upset. Some commentators will say it's because the money changers were stealing and ripping people off. It's, we don't get any indication that that's happening in the text. This is a violation of worship and sacred space. And so what Jesus does is he removes the marketplace activity from the temple, and then he's questioned by the Jews. Now, when it says the Jews in here, be careful with this, because the exact word in the Greek is Judeans. This is, this is making a reference to the people who are in charge of the temple-like structure, okay? Not necessarily the entire ethnic race of the Jewish people. These are like the aristocrats, the leaders, okay? Uh, that's just translated as Jews, but actually Judeans would probably be a better translation. Those who are in charge of the care of the temple are upset by this. What authority do you have over this? Because essentially what Jesus is also doing is he's changing the sacrificial and worship system of the Israelites. By removing the animals from the temple, there's no more animals to be sacrificed in the temple area. And so he says what? He says, destroy this temple. He's pointing to his body. Where the true place of divinity dwells. You know, it was believed that the temple was the house of God. It's where God dwelled. But now Jesus says the real place of worship, the real place of God's divinity where it resides, is right here inside his humanity destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And so, what Jesus is essentially doing is the priest, the victim, the temple, he takes it all upon himself. This is why we get this reading in the Lenten season. Because what, we're getting ready for what? For Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Right? Those two days, they, go, they always go together. We don't just celebrate Jesus' death, and we also just don't celebrate Jesus' resurrection. We celebrate them together. That the first step of our salvation is our Lord becoming both priest, victim, and the location of sacrifice, his very body offered up for the forgiveness of our sins while we are still sinners. Right? It's, it's, not, us, it's not us being perfect, 
It's us in our sinfulness, and yet our Lord still loving us and has a priest offering up his body for the forgiveness of our sins. Then matched with the resurrection is what is God's acceptance, the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice, which means eternal life. Not only the Son has eternal life, but he wishes us to share an eternal life. You see, worship, when we worship God, we're joining in the worship of Jesus Christ. We're joining in his one sacrifice. We're uniting our bodies to the body of our Lord, so our bodies then become a temple as, as well. We become also the victim. We unite our own sinfulness, our own victimhood, our own sufferings. We unite it to the, the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It's not just uh, the Lord doing all the work and we have our sins forgiven and we're happy. No, he wants us to take up his cross and follow him, to process into the temple, into the place of worship, and join with him. He wants you to unite your sufferings to him so that he can turn it around, glorify it, resurrect it, and defeat sin, defeat death, defeat these sufferings that we have in this world. Sufferings, death, sin, these are all temporary realities in our life. God's love, God's glory, and God's resurrection is eternal. So as we continue on with this Mass, it's not just us worshiping God. It's not just Jesus worshiping the Father. It's us being united and joined with him in his one true and perfect offering to God the Father. May God bless you.